Um, my name is Danny, and I am here to talk to you guys today about engaging design and UX contributors. Um, part of that is going to involve um, talking a little bit about what design actually means um, to me and to hopefully many of you in this room, um, talking about what it's like to be a designer in the Drupal community and talking about some of the roadblocks that I've uncovered in some of the research that I've been doing on the community um, for the last couple of years. Uh, so first, let me tell you a little bit about me. Um, I am entirely too busy. Um, right now, I'm actually finishing my master's degree at Bentley University in the Boston area of Massachusetts. So that means I'm working at both the Bentley User Experience Center and Patients Like Me in Waltham or in uh, Cambridge. So I've got two jobs, plus a thesis, plus um, a daughter. And um, I also wrote a book called Drupal for Designers for O'Reilly in 2012, which is actually, I'm going to be signing those books tomorrow if anyone wants to stop by and say hello, um, because clearly I have all the free time. And um, what else have I done? Oh, yes, I'm the UX lead on the community tools team, which means that, yes, that was me in the keynote. Um, and clearly I've gotten the Dries bump, or you guys are just really pumped about design. Um, either way, I'm glad to see you all. So what I'd like to start with is what happens when a designer goes into a contribution sprint? So how many in this room are actually, you know, consider yourselves designers, whether visual, UX, what have you? Okay, and how many of you have actually gone to contribution sprints and like done, done work? Okay, so let me, um, I'd love to hear your story um, a little. Oh, okay, okay, no worries. Um, so one of the things that I did, um, I've been going to contribution sprints for quite a while. And at the last contribution sprint, which was at DrupalCon Austin, a couple things happened. First thing that happened was I tried to start sort of a community tools sprint because obviously I'm the UX lead of the community tools team now. We've got a bunch of stuff that we're working on. And it turned into sort of a an ad hoc research brainstorming study. So this is something that I do fairly frequently. Um, I'm working with a bunch of different people in the community. I'm pulling people out from the hallways. We've got whiteboards. We've got post-it notes. We've got markers. I'm like in the zone, right? And we're figuring out all of these problems. What is it that people are searching for? Why do people actually come to D.O? What is the thing that they're looking for when they're actually trying to get stuff done? And, you know, this to me is just a beautiful thing. This is what I do. This is what I love to do. So now, where the hell do I put it? We've got all of this knowledge. We've got all of this interesting stuff. Like, oh, yeah, so we think that this is where we're going. We think this is where we should be heading. Where do I put it? So that someone who actually works on this stuff can take this knowledge and run with it. So I ask my collaborators, so, okay, so where should this go? Oh, put it in the issue queue. So now, I'd like to take a moment to have a fun activity. Here's the D.O homepage. Find the issue queue. Anyone? Sure, but what project is this? <laughs> yeah, exactly. But this is what we deal with all the time, isn't it? Even if you're not, like, what, what's interesting is I started studying contributors when I first, so a little bit of, you know, back history about me and my infinite schooling, the master's degree. One of the things that I decided I wanted to do, elected, I elected to do this. When I started my master's program, I said, I want to do a thesis. And I want to specifically do a thesis on the roadblocks that design contributors face in the Drupal community. Because nobody does this research. And I find it really interesting. I've been in the community for five years. I want to see what this is so we can make this better. And the biggest thing that I found, being an actual design contributor, was the minute I had something 
that felt like we could move forward, I had no idea where to put it. And when it was explained to me where I should put it, yes, I should look for the project. But guess what? There were something like three different projects that it could be in. And which one of the projects do I put it in? So just that right there is more than enough headaches for anyone who's not slightly batty, and I'll admit to that right now, to say, oh, screw this. I'm not dealing with this anymore. But then another thing happened at DrupalCon Austin. So who knows Morton? Yeah. <laughs> so Morton comes up, and in that classic Morton way, says, I am going to scream. I'm doing a very bad Morton impression right now, but that's okay. And I said, well, okay, why? Hold on, why? And he says, we need to reach consensus. So I said, okay, well, then you need Post-its. I have them. So I, like, grab Post-its out of my bag, run out into the hallway, and basically put these Post-its on the wall, grab some sheets of paper. I'm like, all right. And I'm, you know, kind of like I am now. I tend to take my shoes off when I'm thinking. It's a weird thing. But... We're running around, and I'm saying, all right, tell me what you found. And he's telling me about how themers fall into two camps. There's the, I just want clean code, I want sensible defaults, and I want to control all the things. And we figured out the size of the camps, and we figured out all of these different things and all of these strategies. John Albin shows up at the same time that my toddler shows up. And so I end up sort of having to run around with my toddler. And when I came back, this whole group had formed around John and Morton. And so there's some interesting things here. Now, this is not necessarily a critique as much as it is an observation, but one of the things that happened was during this moment, I had actually pulled in three of my friends who I knew to be in one of the camps because I knew that Morton was in the control all the things camp. And I knew we needed to hear perspective from the people who just want sensible defaults. And I happened to see a couple of them in the hallway. So like I do, I just grabbed them and pulled them here and says, you, you need to give him perspective on this stuff. But when I came back, this was what I saw. So two of those people, the one on the far left and the, one in, and the woman in the middle, those were the people I brought in at the beginning. Notice how now they're in the periphery. And it kind of looks like everyone's just watching John and Morton argue with, with each other. So this is something that I don't think we acknowledge as much as we want to in the community. Um, there are certain people we tend to defer to as authorities. And until they show up, it's often like we don't necessarily think we have a say. And I observed this when I was working on user profiles. So one of the things that I've done recently is basically revamped the user profiles for Drupal.org. A lot of the work that you saw in Dries' keynote started from that work that I was doing. And one of the things that I experienced was the issue didn't feel like it was gaining traction until Angie and Jen Hodgden and a couple of these other sort of big name contributors started commenting on it. And while we definitely want to have this idea of, you know, community leadership, we also, especially as new contributors, we shouldn't have to, like, sit in the sidelines and feel like, well, you know, unless this person gets involved, I can't really say anything, or my contribution won't be valued. All right, so this is, this is something we need to be aware of, especially when we're trying to make big, big decisions. Another thing we have to think about is this particular event that I'm talking about, this consensus banana, happened on June 2nd. It took two weeks to get into the issue queue from that date. Again, not a critique, just an observation. There's a lot of, half, there's a lot of stuff, a lot of decisions get made, a lot of important conversations are had, a lot of things move forward at contrib sprints that the community doesn't know about. 
usually for a couple of weeks afterwards. And if a person is not at DrupalCon and is not at the sprints, they're often completely left out of that conversation. And this goes for development, goes for design, it goes for a lot of different areas of contrib. When I first started the research that I'm doing now, I really thought that this was just about design and UX contributors and how they're so different than developers and developers have it so easy. But the more I looked into it, the more I realized this is all over the Drupal community. This is the way, this is the roadblocks that we put in place and the hoops that we make people go through just to be productive as a contributor. So some of the things that are specific to design and UX contributors that I uncovered in my research. And um, in terms of methods, I'm happy to go over like the full methodology, but this has been about a year of interviews, observation at code sprints while I was actually participating in them, and also a survey which had about 180 um, feedback from about 180 people, most of whom were actually contributors. So some of the things that I saw over and over again, one was getting feedback from everyone in the community, not just the couple of big name contributors. So this is specific to design discussions. On the profile, for example, we really needed to get everybody, the hobbyists, the new contributors, the people who are mostly site builders, the people who are using the system, we needed to get feedback from a broad level of people. What we ended up with was a whole lot of comments from three to five people who were brave enough to deal with the issue queue that day. And then, of course, there's the issue queue, which is really not designed to talk about design. And it's really not designed to help us make big decisions that are, you know, that, that really need to be made when the framework gets to this size. I mean, there's a lot of hard decisions that we as a community and we as a group of individuals have to face and have to deal with that we're not able to make effectively because we're doing it all in the issue queue. But the other thing, and these two are very I found very interesting. One was this really pervasive feeling that I'm not a coder. I don't write modules. I, I, I don't contribute because I'm, I don't know code. I can't even tell you how many comments I got. Like, I don't know, you know, I can do usability testing, but where would I put the results of that? Where someone would see them? I don't, like, I don't know how to contribute this particular type of thing. Um, and then the other thing is, and this is specific, I think, to, to UI and design discussions, um, there is a somewhat, like, excessive need for rationale behind everything that you post. Um, I experienced it a little bit with the profile work, but you know, in core, I saw one case of a screen design for the create content page, 300 comments, just in the issue queue. And prior to that, it was six months of debating groups and required a blog post by all of the people who actually worked on that design, explaining why they made the changes they made and the rationale behind them and the whole process. And I gotta tell you, you saw what I do for a living. I ain't got that time. So can you imagine anyone else who has a family and a job and maybe is in school taking the time to write a blog post, tweet about it, go into IRC, grab a bunch of people to go in and comment on it, hash everything out in groups, and then bring it into the issue queue so that you can hash everything out again. And we wonder why sim seemingly simple changes take three years to implement. So I wish I could say that this is just design, but I've seen this happen with the, <laughs> yeah, I know, you, you know. Um, I saw this happen also with the transition to GitHub. People are still bringing this issue up. 
the the GitHub versus GitLab or whatever it is. Like I've seen this on groups and I follow it. And like every couple of months, someone else is like, yes, let's do GitHub. And then someone shoots him down and then, yes, let's do GitHub. That's been happening for a year and a half. And some of this, I think, is the nature of an open source community. We're all humans. Humans are kind of stupid. And we don't necessarily have time to read through all of the crap that we get fed. Um, but I think some of it we're doing to ourselves. And I worry that we're making it actively difficult for people to come in and actually be productive as contributors and still have lives. I worry a lot about that. Um, so this is where I turn to you guys. There are some ideas that I have in my mind. I think we have a messaging issue. I think we have a process issue. I think that there are definitely ways that we can improve. But I want to hear from you guys. How do we fix this? What are the actual opportunities we have to make this better? And how do we actually take action on them? So um, two notes. One, um, I had a very similar conversation with Mark Bolton five years ago at DrupalCon Paris <clears throat> because for those who weren't around then, Mark Bolton was hired to do the design for Drupal.org and then hired to do the design for Drupal 7. To, he designed the 7 theme. And he got the same kind of nitpick on everything um, that annoys just about every designer who ever touches Drupal. Yeah. And just about everyone else. Um, and when I say designer, I don't mean visual designer. I mean anyone who's doing anything higher level than four lines of code. I'm a designer. I'm just designing architecture, not, uh, not pictures. Mm -hmm. So any design gets the same treatment. And a lot of it is because we're an open source community. Open source people are used to being able to crack something open, look inside, and see how it works. Mm. And design at Feels whatever like level, magic. it is inherently subjective. Mm -hmm. There is inherent subjectivity to it where you can't crack it open and look at every line of code to see how you got there. And so that annoys people who are used to that. Mm -hmm. So there's an inherent conflict between just the open source tinkering mentality and consistent just thought through design because there's so much subjectivity inherent in that. And I would argue that there's a hell of a lot of tinkering that happens in design. Mm -hmm. um, but we as a community don't, really have the tools, and, and this is true of any community that deals with distributed teams, by the way. It's not exclusive to the Drupal community. We don't have the tools to tinker, mm -hmm. um, that, that make tinkering and sketching and brainstorming. Like, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a big collaborative sketch board where we can say, okay, you know, it, like do mind maps somewhere? Design doesn't have an interdiff. Exactly. Exactly. Design doesn't have an intergift, and it, and it requires many more people than someone sitting at work at their desk and writing a bunch of lines of code, making sure it works. And that is not to say that developers aren't creative. I actually believe that developers are some of the cre most creative people I know. But we solve problems differently. Um, and so I think that, you know, I would argue that there's plenty of tinkering that happens in design, it's just not always visible. Absolutely, I mean, the, with the code, it's a lot easier for someone who is not tinkering to come in late, look at it, and understand all the bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily trivial, but it's easier to do that with a patch than it is with the design of a UI. Mm -hmm. um, the other point I'll note, a huge part of the problem, this is teaser for my core conversation tomorrow, mm -hmm. huge part of it is our completely untransparent, implicit leadership structure, which means you don't actually know who the big people are who wander and buy, and you're supposed to listen to them. Mm -hmm. They exist. They're never not going to exist. We should just be explicit about who they are, and that mm -hmm. will help a lot. 
Yeah. But right now, we try to pretend it's not the case, which means we're lying to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Let's stop lying to ourselves. For more on that, come to my core conversation tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> well, and actually, that gives me, I mean, that gives me the idea, like, one of the things I was thinking about is what if there were teams? What if, there, what yes. if we were explicit that a module had a team behind it, that a section of core had a team behind it? I mean, how many of us, how many of us consider ourselves professional designers? How many of us consider ourselves like magic unicorns with a design stick that you just wave and design magically happens? You? Awesome. Glad. I'll, get, I'll, I'll make sure to like craft you a nice horn that you can wear. Um, design requires people. More than just about anything else. I mean, I've been doing this since the frickin' 90s. I can't, I, I don't want to say that out loud again. Um, I've been doing this for a long frickin' time. And you know what? When you're just sitting and banging out comps, you're not the designer in the room. You're the pixel pusher. You're the one who makes things pretty. When you're a designer, you're at the head of the table and helping everyone agree on what the direction is. You're listening to a bunch of different people from every different part of the room. I mean, that's what this whole brainstorming thing was. Right? So both of these things were just as much design as putting together a compass. This is how we got to the user profile. This is how we got to figuring out what the priorities are. This is something that designers do every day. Whether we're sitting in a room putting together comps or whether we're facilitating workshops. We have to decide what is the most important and how do we give the most important things the visual prominence they need. And so there's an opportunity here for us as designers to help facilitate those kind of conversations within the stuff that we see in Drupal.org, but we need the infrastructure to support it. Oh, yes, microphone. Oh. <laughs> All right, so I'll repeat what you're saying. All right, so uh, is there an agreement on what needs to be done for helping out designer, like in Spain, Drupal or Power? I'm sure we can get lots of developer actually to make the changes happen. Yes. We just need to know what. <laughs> yeah, and I think that that's another, I mean, that's another challenge I've seen. So what, what um, Theodore is saying is that you know, the developers want to help us. <laughs> they do. They just need to know what to do. And, I mean, that's actually one of the areas where I think we as designers need to take some leadership. And we need to do some self-reflection. So we need to think, what is it that we need to do? But then also, I mean, this I think is one of the things that the content working group is working on right now. Like, where do you find things? Where do you find things? Where do you put them? We just don't know anymore. We've got too much crap on this site that's been growing for, and what was it that you told me at Design for Drupal, Larry? Like, we've hacked the shit out of the issue queue far beyond what it was ever meant to do. <laughs> like, we know the issue queue sucks. The issue queue sucks for every box. Developers just want stuff. Yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so I think, you know, this is one thing that as, you know, as designers, if you want to contribute to Drupal, there are things for you to do. But we need more designers to come in and take leadership roles and basically say, this is you know, what I see we can do. What can we do to make this happen? What can we do to facilitate this? And this is where we turn to design as problem solving and also problem defining. I don't know how many of you have done this kind of work, but how many times have you dealt with a client who says, I want XYZ widget. And you have to ask them, okay, so why? And they can't answer that question. That's where the Drupal community is now. That's really where we are right now. We're throwing all of these idea, uh, ideas at the wall. 
And what we need is more people to come in and say, okay, so how is that going to actually help us? What is the big picture here? I mean, if anything, that's where we're going to shine. Mm, microphone. Oh, they really packed you guys tight, didn't they? Yeah. I see myself as both a designer and a developer because I think it's, it's you, you know, you have to know the platform that you're designing for, uh, get that feedback. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I really like because there's both of this, uh, you know, collaboration. So we have a shared understanding, and, and actually to break break down the you know the specialities of the developers and designers mm -hmm. that are throwing documentation or or sketches. Uh, so, so so I think maybe uh, I like that. Mm -hmm. I teach it to my uh, develop, web developer students, and he, uh, every, everyone is a designer, and it's just, you know, sketching some level to mm -hmm. getting away from the, the pixels. Yes. Well, and actually, uh, did you have something to say, Larry? Oh, you are just, okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, and I think that, you know, I think that Drupal can learn a lot from the Lean UX approach. Um, not necessarily the anti-deliverable approach, because one of the thing, one of the uniquenesses of our community is we exist everywhere, and so the person you are working on a particular project with is is often not going to be in the same room with you, and you have to find ways to encourage collaboration in a very distributed and self-organizing team. So there are some ways in which we need to be able to support um, asynchronous feedback. So you know, feedback from someone who's not necessarily in your same time zone. At the same time, the big thing that we really need is we need to be able to do more than just discuss something. We need to be able to show design, to, to essentially show our work, to use a math class term. Uh, if you want to say something, please form a line behind the microphone. This is getting recorded, which means anyone listening to this afterward will have no clue what's happening for the second half of this talk if you're not up here. It's true. So if it takes a while to get up from the chairs, just get up and form a line here, please. Yeah, I'm not sure why we're not doing like a, like a Bob Barker, like pass the microphone around. Can because you this do thing that? Is a, it's wired, not wireless, unfortunately. So I looked, I checked. So stupid. It's, it's taped <laughs> to the ground. I can't carry it around. The AV team would yell at me if I tried to pull it up. I know. Well, Please you know, come up and stand by the microphone. Yeah, and the funny thing is, like, I tend to walk around. Like, I literally took my shoes off because that's a thing that I do. And I like to walk around. And when I was in Austin, it was the same problem. I had to, like, stand here at the podium and be very... Very still. All right, so I mean, that's basically what I have to say. But I want to hear from you guys. What What is it that you want to make happen? How do we fix this? Sorry, <laughs> All right, two questions. Yeah. Um, one is. Uh, Maybe because I walked in a little later. You know, are we talking about UX contributions for D.O. And, and and Drupal infrastructure for Drupal projects, or or for for what? Um, so when I talk about design, I kind of mean big D design, right. um, which is you know design as a way of solving problems and really sort of getting down to the nitty gritty of what we're doing here. So on that level, I consider design and UX contributors to be people who want to contribute design and UX to the Drupal project. Now, that could be core, it could be contrib modules, it could be um, evangelizing design within the Drupal community like Design for Drupal does. Um, it could be any of those things. But I do think that we have a significant issue when it comes to discussing design 
like discussing design essentially and design improvements within Drupal itself and certainly within Drupal.org. I think in general that's true, but when you, when you separate out the idea that, you know, there's co design and core and, you know, Drupal core and the core is your queue, whatever, and then design in this sort of federated contrib space and then design in this, this tertiary D.O. sense, right? The, the, the incentives for somebody to participate in design are different for each one of those facets, right? Mm -hmm. the, the reason somebody would want to participate in core design versus a contrib project which is, you know, wholly owned maybe by this one person or group of persons and then versus D.O. which is at once really easy to, to participate in and also impossible to change. Yeah. Um, the incentives are all kind of different for each, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we're talking about how to solve this, I, I don't think there's like this one like thing that we can say, oh yeah, boom, that will fix for everything, you know? Mm -hmm. or, or even that one approach is gonna even remotely come close to solving it. Yeah. Um, and I agree with you there. I think that, you know, I, I think that the issue is, as most design issues is, is more complex than just like let's come up with a solution. Um, I think that one of the challenges that we face is that we have a very rigid process sort of defined for core, or at least we think we do. But then we consider contrib to be the wild west and people can just do whatever people want to do as long as they adhere to the coding standards. And so as a designer, I think it's very hard to come into this space and even know where to contribute. Like so, where would I put my energy? So why not focus on contrib then, being that that's the one with the lowest barrier to entry? Um, I don't know that it would be the lowest barrier to entry. Because, for example, like one of the things that I saw in the, in the um, survey from designers was that contrib maintainers are surly when you try to suggest UI improvements. <laughs> and one of the things that we do as, de you know, one of, the, one of the particular situations and why I focused on design and UX contributors is that most often we're not the ones implementing the things we design. So an inherent complication of our job is that the duocracy doesn't seem to apply to us because we can't actually do the thing. All we can do is say, here's what we think it should be. Here's why we think it should be that. Could you do it pretty please? And even when you do it, we don't necessarily get credit for it. So like, so, you know, this is one of the reasons why, even though I think that the, the barriers that we put in place for contributors happen across the board, I do think that designers and UX folks are in a very particular spot because they have to spend much more of their time just defending their right to be on D.O. I didn't mean to hold the hog the microphone. I'm just like, you're like looking right at me, so I'm like, I should. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, maybe but something I, I, I would like to add to this is um, that design is not anymore just um, a add-on to Drupal mm -hmm. or to any site you do. Uh, I think we at Drupal, we lag a little bit behind behind the standards of uh, UX and design. Mm -hmm. When you look at, at WordPress and at other uh, upcoming CMS, they have really nice uh, admin interfaces. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, it would be really great if we would uh, wake up and um, integrate design and UX more into our processes. And I, mm -hmm. and I agree with you. It's not easy. I have also tried it a little bit. And I, I know that there are, I think there are starts uh, where it uh, turned out really well and where teams are working together. But I think it's, it's not only a process change, it's also a cultural change. Yes. People have to, like, uh, the developer have to accept or have to feel that, that it's great to have a team, that it's great to have input, that it's not only I sit in my room and I, I code this down. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also on the other hand side, we have to mobilize the designers that, that dare to, to come with an issue. Like yeah. now, what everyone could do here in the, in, in the room is like taking a, a, a UX issue from, from Drupal that we all know from working together with clients and, and, and go to a sprint with it and yeah. draw a little mock-up and say, hey, this is my idea, this is how it is now, and this is how I want it to be. Who would help me to implement that? Mm -hmm. And I think also, you know, as designers, like one of the things that we need to do is figure out, is learn what is the best way to give feedback? What is the tone we need to take? What is, how do we suggest these improvements without just ranting about a module? Because we've all seen how well that works. 
So like, so I think it's a give and take on both sides. Developers need to be able to <laughs> welcome the input and say, thank you for helping me and like, how can we work together on this? And designers, we need to apply the same principles that we take to our own work and apply those to the developers of these modules and say, here's some issues, here's some areas I think we can improve. Here's a sketch of what that might look like. What do you think? As opposed to just going and ranting about a module and saying, this UI sucks, here, let me fix it for you. Yeah, so maybe a message of hope for UX and designer. Um, well, back in Drupal 7, there was much less people working on the front end, either CSS or JavaScript mm -hmm. or HTML. But now that's changed, we actually have a big front end team mm -hmm. that you know address issues. And those are the guys that implement UX uh, and design, you know, new design and new UX uh, stuff. So it's going to get better, <laughs> but we still need more people on the front end, uh, mm -hmm. you know, developers to help you, basically. Um, so hang in there, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, two thoughts I want to share, uh, and also as comments. One of the thoughts is uh, every major company that works uh, in the CMS um, business, mm -hmm. usually they start a new project by launching a new UI. So mm. there's a completely new set of um, icons and everything. So they start by launching a new UX-ish. That's mm -hmm. thought number one. Um, which leads me to, uh, to, to Drupal. The problem may be uh, the way that we are organized. Okay. Um, I work, work as a volunteer at a big music, musical festival uh, in Denmark, where I live. Uh, we're about 10,000 volunteers. And no one, uh, we, we create a lot of bars and scenes, but no one, and I really mean no one, would make a sign for a bar without going asking uh, to the sign painters about uh, having uh, m them make a sign for us. So nobody does anything front end without mm. asking the design team. Mm. Okay. So that's how that music festival is organized. So no one does front end without asking a real uh, designer. Okay. Yes, please. Um, hey, uh, I'm new to the Drupal community. I'm from OwnCloud. Um, Welcome. And, hey, uh, and uh, so, from my experience, uh, the the working yeah designers and developers working together, or you don't really have that when you don't really have that much of a split between developers and designers. You have front enders and stuff. It really, no matter what the split is, it really boils down to the trust that mm -hmm. people have towards each other and. Um, um, that kind of belongs to the designers to properly uh, communicate and to properly document the changes, why stuff has changed mm -hmm. that way. So I would actually disagree with what Larry said before, that design is highly subjective. I would actually say it's, it's largely objective because that's, mm -hmm. that's why you do usability testing, you do research, you write up specs, you do mm -hmm. mock-ups and stuff. So actually, mostly design is, is really objective, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, sure, not when it comes to theming, that's a different topic. Um, but uh, in general, I found that, that that works really well. If you if you document everything, if you mm -hmm. spec everything, you do mockups plus writing, yep. then uh, developers have trust that you're making the right decisions because they mm -hmm. also see that it works, and um, yeah, they they come to you or to the designers. Yeah, and I think that, and I think that uh, and I think that that's definitely true to a certain extent. I think that what Larry was trying to get at was that, you know. Design, there's a lot of people who either like or dislike a design. So on that level, yes, it's subjective. Like there are, there are some stakeholders that all of us have had to deal with that really don't care what usability testing said. Yeah. They like it that color blue and they want it to stay that color blue. Right. So, so there's, there's a little bit of both. I think that one of the problems that um, design contributors face um, based on the research I've done is not necessarily the need for documentation, but the excessive need for documentation and feedback 
And like to a level, like this is your worst client. Mm. Um, and you know, I don't think I've seen as much of it as some other people. I think that the community got a lot better in the time that I was just sort of watching the community and waiting for my opportunity to actually come in and contribute something. But I mean, there were times literally where everything was months of arguing. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the flip side of it, kind of, that new contributors, um, t it, it uh, tends to be, or sometimes tends to be, that um, people just, or designer, design contributors just submit mock-ups or just submit mm -hmm. visual changes without any um, reasoning behind it, yeah. or so it seems. And that's really a stark contrast to how it should be. And it, I mean, actually working in an open source project as a designer is the mm -hmm. hardest thing I can mm -hmm. really imagine. Like it's harder than in any agency. Uh, so that's also really turning off the new contributors. But at the same time, yeah, the existing designers really need to, uh, um, yeah, document it. Yeah, it's a two-way street. Yeah. It very much is. Thank you. Uh, two completely uh, separate ideas. So okay. first, um, the, this design is actually difficult because you also need to think about the mental model and how the system can look very different on different um, uh, use cases. So mm -hmm. um, someone configures the Drupal side and has the same uh, UI on the back end, but it looks completely different because there are different entity types or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so you need to have like the complete picture in, in mind when you design this of how it can look like and the different situations where it's um, mm -hmm. applied, uh, which has different expectations for it. So, okay. And then the second thing that I thought of that was just a quick idea, I don't know where it goes, is um, if designers would actually produce something like um, documentation, like a spec or a design patterns written mm -hmm. or design guidelines, anything that, so that uh, designers could have a discussion and actually come up with something without having to wait for someone to implement it. Mm -hmm. And then um, this could even be in, in version control. And so you would say, like, if before it says, yeah, this should be yellow, and then someone says, yeah, I think red is better, and then you just say, change the sentence which says this thing should be ye yellow, and you say, it should be red, and mm -hmm. then you make a commit, and you can even explain what you changed and why you did it. Mm -hmm. And so you would actually have something instead. I mean, now if, if you discuss something, and then someone has to implement it, and they have to look in the discussion what was decided there, that seems like unproductive. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, th I think both are good points. Um, I would argue that many of us who are designers are more than, we have our share of complex systems that we have to work with on a daily basis. I don't think that Drupal is unique in that. So for example, I work at a rail, like patients like me where I work in Cambridge is a rail shop and that is the same thing. I mean, depending on what condition you have, the entire UI changes. Um, and that's something that we're very familiar with in the Drupal world. Um, and in terms of design patterns, that's actually something that is being worked on now, is design patterns for contrib maintainers. Um, I don't know the status of that just yet, but if anyone is interested in contributing to that, um, get in touch with Lewis Nyman, because he's doing a lot of that work. Yeah, so I was just going to say, I, th I think one of the powers of, of having an, a, an open source project um, is the ability for you to just jump in and do whatever that you want to override something that exists. So you, you don't really, my point is you don't always have to get something into, uh, you know, into a, a, a contrib module, for instance. You could just mm -hmm. say, you know, I have, I've created this patch. Do you want to implement this? No, that's fine. I'm just going to roll my own pat module that overrides your styles, and that's the way I want it. And then you can see what kind of adoption you get from the community. And as the adoption gets bigger, then that becomes more of a, a pertinent issue to get into their into their module. And this is, I've done this a ton of times. You know, for Panelizer, you know, Panelizer was very ugly, so I was like, okay, let's redo this in a, in a might, much more, you know, a way that makes more sense for Drupal, and redid that, and then it's got a really big adoption rate. So. Um, I think that there are ways for you to to get in without having some not at the mercy of a contributor or, or, or the, the the maintainer of modules mm -hmm. and the, the maintainer of um, uh, I guess it really only works in the module world and in the theme world because you can't really say change this on do but <laughs> it is it is it is a place where you can you know start to get introduced into um, you know doing some of your own design patterns without having to um, require that 
piece of it to be part of it. You don't mm -hmm. have to have that be in their module. You can write your own patch or you can write your own module that overrides that. So mm -hmm. I think that that's a pretty good way to go and it's worked pretty well and people are okay with having that be a method mm -hmm. for, you know, getting around that if the maintainer is stubborn in, 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 in the case of what you've said there. So Yeah. Um, well, and at the same time, though, uh, I mean, many people who do... You know, many many of the people who do patches end up contributing those patches because it's one less thing for them to maintain. Exactly. Yeah. So and if you so can do like, that and then show that it has an adoption, then they become more likely to want to do that. Yeah. You know? So. Yes. Yeah. Just had a thought about um, like contract modules. Okay. Um, is there any any easy way that uh, a developer could ask a designer for UX? Uh, help actually. I think yes. honestly, the easiest way, the the easiest way to reach out to you know designers or UX designers is to list it on your project page. Like we need to. I haven't figured out a good way to solve this particular problem. If you are interested in working with me on designer UX, please contact me. Well. Hmm. So there is a usability group, um, I, and you could also reach out to the usability group. I feel like you'd probably get more immediate traction if you list it on your project page as well, because that's where someone's going to read the documentation for your module. And so your project's going to get more wide adoption if you have a complete, you know, here's what it does, here's the documentation anyway. So if you also say, you know, these specific problems I haven't figured out a good solution for. If you're a designer and you want to help with the UI, please get in touch with me. I think that's a really great way of signaling that you're open to that feedback. I was uh, more thinking of a, like a, a bigger scale, like mm -hmm. where you could see like these people are UX people, you could ask them for help and so these modules need help or yeah so that's actually that's a fantastic idea um, I would love to see some sort of matchmaking service for yeah. <laughs> UI and what yes I know I want to see something like that um, and I, th I think like that's where I'd like to see it headed um, I am on the community tools team I will bat my eyelashes at the DA <laughs> Um, I don't know how far we can get, but that is definitely something that I feel like, because I mean, I really feel like Contrib needs love. It really does. Um, and I think that we do ourselves a disservice as a community by putting this distinct process, or whatever we call it, around core, and then telling Contrib, well, you can do whatever the hell you want. Um, I think we do Contrib a major disservice in that way. Because honestly, even with court in the state, it is an eight, which is very strong. There's still a lot you can't do without contrib modules. And so, you know, especially when you start getting into things like, I mean, workbench needs help. <laughs> you know, like views needed help a long time ago. WYSIWYG needed help. Like all of these different things that just need, they need some love. Um, so I think that's a great idea. And I think that somebody should work on that. <laughs> so as a, as a reply directly to that, um, there is a Google Usability Team that exists kind of, right? I mean, is, is that there is. Is so who's doing that? What do you do? But I, I feel like Boyan's the only one in there. Like, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, you are? OK. But like with other projects, like with Nova and Notepad, I mean, it's really a good experience to like focusing on that. Like, also, because our team is a developer's tool. Yeah. So just like have people come in there, be it developers and developers. Yeah, I mean, what I'm thinking actually, what I'm thinking is something more, like what, what's in my mind is more along the lines of elegant.ly. I don't know if anyone's familiar with this. It's basically a service that hooks up designers with startups. And in order to be listed there um, on this site as a startup, you need to have a business plan. You need to prove that your model is scalable. Like there's all of these things you need to do to prove that you're serious. And then the designers get to go in there with their qualifications and decide whether you're worth basically working for free in exchange for equity. And I feel like if we had a model like that for Contrib, where each side is basically saying, you know, here's, here's an example of my commitment to this process. 
Um, I think that can work really nicely for contrib and not require too much more than what we currently put in front of contributors. In fact, it might even make it easier because it basically helps create these self-organizing teams that were being talked about next door. You know, it's like I, I use this, you know, I wanna make a module that does this, but I need a GUI behind it, so I need a partner with, I need a partner to help me with that. Thank you. And I think we have time for, I, let me just double check the time. 15 minutes, all right, cool. Yeah. Okay, hi. So I'm like I'm the uh, core maintainer for the uh, sub core subsystem that probably has like the the well not probably the, the worst UI ever, <laughs> namely field API and field UI. Uh, and so standing at the other end of the line, I kind of like I have the same position and the same uh, question as you. I like I don't know how to make this happen that like we get to a better field UI. I have no idea. Yeah, what's wrong with it to begin with? Uh, I, I have no idea how to make that happen and mm -hmm. I kind of know for sure that like it won't happen on the D.O issue queues. Mm. And I've kind of like completely abandoned even like getting involved in UI, uh, UX issues about field UI in the issue queue because after a couple of them, like I know in advance that they're not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. And so like the, the, the one single similar example that I know of and that I can think of is the Views UI. That was uh, the work that was done for Views 3 in D7. Yeah. And that thing only happened because a acquire fund funded it. Yep. And uh, B, it was uh, kicked off, well, it, most of it happened in a dedicated sprint with people in one room for several days in a row mm -hmm. to like hash the thing out. Because like it might be simpler, it might be doable on the D.OECQ for maybe smaller scoped UX issue, but for uh, systems like these views, field, field API, like it's a really a complex combination mm -hmm. between the constraints of the, of the system, like why is the API that way? Because like, it, it has its own set of fairly complex constraints. So it would be nice that if the UI allowed that, but like it's not possible because we can't code it or it wouldn't mm -hmm. work because of this or that. And getting each team uh, with a, an intimate knowledge of that, the, the, the workings of, of the, the system we're trying to design a UX for, like it, it really takes time and mm -hmm. most of the like, there are repeatedly one-off suggestions. Hey, we, sh we could try that too. and you can shut them down pretty easily because no, the API cannot support that and cannot work that way for even that reason. Mm -hmm. And getting to that point of knowledge takes, really takes time. One other thing maybe is about, I don't know, may maybe it's about tooling. Like I don't, I have no clue what are the uh, UX and, and mockups and, and design tools available, except uh, apart than like just writing the code and testing it live. Mm -hmm. And there is one big limited scope, but still it's a 2K, 200K patch uh, issue to, to, to make some part of field UI better. But like the current process mostly is, yeah, we should try it that way. But in order to try it, we, someone needs to code it first. Mm -hmm. And so it takes an immense amount of time and it's just like it's after three iterations, everyone is completely discouraged. So maybe it's a question of tooling. What could we, what tools could we use to mm -hmm. like try things and agree on things without first having to code for them? Yeah, well, and I think this is, I mean, this, bli you know, this, this belies the importance of having teams and having a designer on the team and, and, and part of being on a team, um, certainly my role on projects as a designer is often to figure out what are those constraints and then how do we make improvements within those. And in terms of tools, I mean, there are many different tools you can use. It really depends on the designer. But a lot of it, you know, this, this is where the argument of having someone who's embedded with you guys and is, 
going along that journey with you. Like I am the designer for Field UI. Um, and so I've been saying for a while, we need design maintainers as much as we need code maintainers. Because a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with, um, media, field, views, like these are really complex systems with a lot of dependencies and a lot of things that, you know, you need that sort of intimate knowledge and you need to stick with it for the entire period of time. Um, so I don't have an immediate answer for you, unfortunately. Um, but I would say if you have UX designers on your team, um, if, or if you want to reach out to any of the folks in, in here who are UX designers, and just start talking to them about the issue at the sprint, and say, what are the, you know, what are the things that we can do here? Here's our limitations. How do we design within them? Hi. Hi. Um, I'm a project manager, so I'm oh, mostly okay. sitting between developers, uh, designers, and this weird thing called customers. <laughs> uh, and Wait, nobody mentioned something? customers yet today, or even users, mm. user stories. And these are usually the things that we use to bind developers, designers together. Um, and you kind of, that's kind of what you have there. Mm -hmm. Those drawings you have, that could be a user story. Oh, yeah. And it could be a good basis for a dialogue between developers and designers um, and, and, you know, create common ground. But I think the team solution is where we need to go. Yeah. Because you shouldn't be developing anything without a user story. Mm -hmm. I know that sounds really annoying if you're a developer. Mm -hmm. But if you can't justify a, a, an end user that really wants your function, you shouldn't be doing it. Mm -hmm. It might be a technical issue, but that's different. That's really core. But most, most of the stuff you do you should have a story. If it has a story that has a user interface and user interaction, you should have a designer in there. And you should, of course, have a, a project manager to make sure it all happens. But that's another story. Um, but it needs to be a bit bigger, everything. And it needs to be pulled out of, but yeah, but I want to do this without anybody interfering with the stuff I'm doing, with I see as sort of the developer idea and even the design idea sometimes. You know, I'd like to do this, and I'm doing it in my free time. So nobody should tell me what I should do. Mm -hmm. And that's OK if you're doing your own home page or doing it for yourself. But this has gotten too big for that. Mm -hmm. It's OK if you're in the French somewhere and doing your own module. That's OK. But if you want to make a good module that should be used by a lot of people, you need to get a designer in there. You need to have a team. I'm not saying you need a project manager, but it might be a good idea mm -hmm. to make sure that somebody you know, goes out there and finds the right resources for you, knows who to talk to, know how to pull in the right resources and more developers if needed. So I'm not, I mean, there are tools for doing that, like professional tools for mm -hmm. project management. Well, it's I think also that's where, I mean, that's certainly where organizational credit comes in because, you know, certainly in, in uh, Larry's case at Palantir, like you guys have teams that are working on modules, right? Nominally? Not as much as we'd like to. Okay. So you guys should have teams that are working on modules, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I think that, you know, organizational credit can go towards that. Um, and I do think that like one of the one of the differences I observed um, when I was talking with French contributors last year is that there is a very different way that French companies treat contrib. It's part of their workday. You get X amount of hours during the work week to work on contrib. And in the States, that's very often not the case. You're sort of expected to do work stuff if you can manage this contrib project you know, in the course of your work stuff, you can do that. But a lot of contributors end up contributing on their own time in the States. And I got to tell you, I've got a toddler. I've got too many things to do. How much time do I have to actually engage in contrib? Not that much. So there's a little bit of got to give happening. So I'm going to have to disagree with the previous commenter. Um, <clears throat> On the one hand, yes, project management does matter. The actual team matters. The there are only there are like seven core initiatives for, officially for Drupal eight. There were only two I would call a success, and mine isn't one of them. Mm. And the primary one is views, because they had from day one two developers, a project manager slash coordinator. Um, it was three developers and a coordinator, but they, they they had a team with different roles, with resourcing from day one. 
it was the only initiative that went well. Yeah. Every other initiative has been a train wreck for that reason. And some of them have been completely disabled, right? Because I think the design in initiative went nowhere. Yeah, the design initiative was stillborn. Um, whiskey, I'm struggling along through sheer force of stubbornness. Um, scotch disappeared. Uh, most of the others petered out eventually to some degree of we got enough done that we can go home now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, Views is the only one that was organized correctly because they had an actual team. Mm -hmm. um, I will have to, you know, the, where I'll disagree though is if you're dealing with a bespoke application, then yes, everything is a user story. If there's no UI, you don't bother building it. Drupal Core is a platform, not a bespoke application, so the rules are a bit different. Certainly anything in the UI should have a user story around mm -hmm. it and have a goal and a purpose and fit into a bigger picture. But to, when you're building a platform, to get to there often requires a lot more plumbing mm -hmm. than, um, than that would imply. And one of our big problems in Drupal historically has been that we don't actually have APIs, we have UIs that are tied directly to the database. Yeah. And you know, we need to break those apart to a large extent so that you can design a UI and a workflow and a an user experience. And independent of that design, a developer experience and design the APIs, design the, the core components and so on. And those should be decoupled from each other far more than they are now. And that would, I think, actually give a lot more flexibility to people who want to be, I say, UI developers for lack of a better term. Um, I mean, the kind of stuff that I do very rarely has a UI to it, the stuff I've been doing at Drupal 8. So I don't deal with designers on a regular basis. The team that wants to now do panels in Drupal 8, oh my god, do they need a designer working with them from day one. If you're interested in that, please, please. That's probably the most important contrib module to have designers working on it, please. Um, but you know, we need to keep those decoupled and have that separation there. So mm -hmm. I think it's also a question not just getting designers and developers working together, but the right designers and the right developers on the right parts of the system. Yeah. Because low-level APIs should not be dictated by UI and vice versa. Yeah. I also think that, you know, I also think that what's, you know, an important thing to think about is, um, oh, I'm losing my thought. <laughs> ah. All right. It's late then. Um, I think it's important to also to bring back this point about a user story is that, you know, a user story could be if you need to make this happen on your website, this mm -hmm. is the module you use. So I almost view a user story as an excuse for this module to exist and something that should be on everyone's project page. If you can't tell me why this module exists and when I would actually need this module, like it shouldn't be on D.O. Feature request, a user story field for project notes. Yeah, like seriously, because it's one of those things like this is just, you know, who here works for themselves? Okay, so those of us who work for ourselves, we understand the importance of actually saying, this is why you should hire me, right? We do that for a living, daily. We say, this is what we do, this is what we bring to the yard, this is why you should hire me. And it's remarkable to me when I see project pages that have like, yeah, this module does this thing. And that's all that it says. Like this does not help me understand whether I should use your module. I, I think a lot of what I'm hearing is the same thing we've been saying every time we've had one of these core conversations in the past six years, mm -hmm. which is we need to talk more and we need to talk at the right time. Yeah. The focus should be on how do we get the pe people talking at the right time? Mm -hmm. How do we close that communication? There have been several failed attempts to do that. Yeah. We, had a, we had a tag at one point for, hey, I need a designer to look at this issue. It died. <laughs> there, because there, a tag in the issue queue is meaningless unless you know that you're looking for that tag. Yeah. And you know, no one has ever owned making and maintaining that communication channel mm -hmm. because, yeah, Every time this has come up as a module developer, I've said, dear God, please, designers, just tell me what to do with the UI for my module and I'll do it. I don't want to think <laughs> about it. Just give me instructions, I'll do it. And most module developers I know have a similar uh, attitude. Yeah. Um, so just the focus needs to be on, the demand is there on both sides. How can yeah. we connect it? How can we do that matchmaking there? 
that's yeah. where we need to put our focus to make that connection happen. And, and I completely agree with you. I mean, I, I, the things that I've been arguing for is a design maintainership over modules. Like actually have a designer listed as a co-maintainer of a module. Um, and just the ability to have some kind of structure around teams and some kind of structure that's around expectations, not just of what your code will look like, but of how you talk about your module and why people should use it. You know, I mean, these are not super high expectations to set. Um, but the fact that we're not doing it, I think is doing a disservice both to core and to contrib. What, what tooling can we do to make that happen? I guess is the open question. Okay, it's I think this finished. is the last one and then we're yeah. done. So I think this is a really valuable uh, discussion and I think we should continue uh, on this. And okay. For example, I am here still on Friday for the sprints. Okay. I would be ready to discuss and... Sweet. Yeah. All right. Well, I will also be at the sprint. So okay. I think, hold on one second. There were like two slides that were related to that as a matter of fact. Okay, so... Um, one is tell me that you love me. Um, feedback. And there is a sprint on Friday. I will be there working with um, Tatiana on a bunch of community initiatives. So um, please, if you see me, come sit down, talk to me, bring me coffee. I will need it. And I really hope we can get some good stuff happening. And thank you all so much.